heaven by your spirit you raised up Saint Teresa of Jesus to show your church the way to perfection may her inspired teaching awaken in us a longing for true holiness may we share her love for you and remain blameless through the new life we receive grant these graces through Christ our Lord Amen Saint Teresa pray for us woke up thinking that I was at the Subiaco Abbey. Subiaco is Benedictine Abbey, pretty much like here over in western Arkansas. And well, how did I get here? <laughs> like, well, no, no, you're not there. You're, you're, you're here in Covington. <laughs> So we began with a look at Teresa's character and grace of determination, to be determined in attitude and in heart to, first of all, be with God, attain His promises, which is paradise, the beatific vision, heaven, being determined opens us up to be more courageous, certainly to be humble, and for the sake of freedom, to be free in and with the Lord. So <clears throat> what are we to be determined in doing? Well, let's have a reflection on St. Teresa's teaching on detachment. We must be determined to be detached from anything that is not of God, by God, for God, to be detached from anything that keeps us from being with Him, knowing Him, loving Him, serving Him. And this is a lifelong endeavor. But we should never, of course, be discouraged because it may take that long. God, like a good parent, brings us along slowly. He's very slow with us. Not that he's slow. <laughs> we are slow. We're slow to understand. We're slow to put the pieces together. We're slow because of fear sometimes, as we mentioned last night. An obstacle to being determined, fear. We are slow to be detached. Because everything due to original sin, the lie was that you will have everything and be godlike. The matter is, we keep everything that many times keeps us from being godlike. So we must be determined to be free of those things. Not in and of themselves. We are the ones who abuse things. We are the ones who put a judgment on things. And therefore either make them good or bad. Things in themselves, because they are inanimate, they're not bad in themselves. God made everything, He made everything good. We got to find the goodness in the things of life, in the things of creation. And those are the things that, one, we should appreciate in having, being given, capable of using them properly. And knowing when, like I mentioned last night too, to let things go. This both is not just material, but very much spiritual. Keeping things of the spirit that are powerful. And retain the good things of the Holy Spirit. Spiritual things can be bad, like lies, a spirit of 
deception, things like that. I mean, the, the evil one is a spirit. Satan's a spirit himself. So he uses that nature to lead people astray in a spiritual way. So just because things are spiritual doesn't make them all virtuous or graced or good for us. We must be able to discern what needs to be detached, what needs to be retained, and when to work for things and when to let things go. St. Teresa says in the Way of Perfection, now chapter 8, number 1, beginning with chapter 8, she's talked about the love of neighbor. Her path, and I think she does this intentionally, this is my estimation. She puts love of neighbor first, then detachment, then humility. One grows out of the other. We have to learn how to love first in order to know what is good for us, what can harm us, and of course that comes through knowing ourselves, knowing what God wants for us, and then we are able to be humble. And it's all, but humility is working all through the first two, love of neighbor and detachment. It's all working at the same time, as all the virtues are. They're all working at the same time. We have to learn how to, because of our limitations, we have to learn how to take one step at a time, which God does. He leads us along one step at a time. So she, she begins with love of neighbor. And she's talked about love of neighbor up to chapter 8. Now with chapter 8, she says, now let us talk about the detachment we ought to have. For detachment, if it is practiced, not just longed for, not just wish, not just desire, it has to be practiced. Trial and error. If it is practiced with perfection, meaning the desire to be whole, it includes everything. If we're going to practice detachment, it includes everything. So we have to look at everything with a eye, with the, with the eye of Jesus, what needs to be detached. Because everything out there can be for the good or for harm. I say it includes everything because if we embrace the Creator, and care not at all for the whole of creation. His majesty will infuse the virtues. We have this indifference towards things of creation. And certainly not an indifference to God. But, but to be careful too of saying that thing's a bad thing or this thing's a good thing. We have to know how to judge. God makes us capable of judging. Sometimes nice people say, well, it's Father, I sinned of judgment. I go, how did you sin of judgment? Well, I just made a mistake. I said, all right, you know, you're okay. It's okay to judge. God gives us the capability to judge. He wants us to judge. If he's given us this capability, then use it. Because judgment precedes decision. We have to make decisions based upon our judgments. The matter is, we don't judge anyone in, the, in regards to, or in the manner of condemning them. That's what Jesus is talking about. We don't judge in that way. But God does expect us to judge, otherwise we can't decide and plan and get to the goal he, did, he has designed for us and what we long to have as well. We have to make judgments. So that's what he's saying, you know, that we embrace the Creator and care not at all. That's the translation. But, the, but it means kind of, you know, we just put things out there. I don't need that. It's not important to me as much as other things are. And we grow in sensing this. He said God will infuse the virtues in us. 
doing little by little what we can, we will have hardly anything else to fight against. It gets easier the more we detach. It is the Lord who in our defense takes up the battle against the demons and against the world. You might say even against our own selves. So there's her introduction to detachment. Together, this is her foundation for the spiritual life. To, to delve into these three virtues: love of neighbor, leading to detachment, which leads then to humility. Humility working all through them, but all the other virtues will be effective, will will be cultivated as we practice these three. But we can find, uh, you know, the virtues that we need. Uh, but as Carmelites, we use these three that she presents to us. But they're the foundation for the spiritual life based upon, you know, self-knowledge and then kind of going more and more towards humility. And of course, as one is perfected, one prepares for that union with God, which is tasted now which we can experience now, but which we will have in its wholeness, its, in its completeness, when we cross over and be with the Lord. So virtues are, so all the virtues for Teresa, just to mention it, is the practice of love. That's what, you know, I have a talk on the virtues, maybe I'll use that one. But just to give you her perspective on what the virtues are, they're, they're practical means to love, or in other words, union with God. John of the Cross would say virtues are means to be purified. There's a grace that God, by which God purifies us. He would even say in the way of perfection, chapter 4, number 10, virtue always inspires love, so always be virtuous. So detachment is a form of love. If it's a virtue, that's a form of love. All the virtues are simply forms of love. They're not something in and of themselves. Patience isn't simply patience. It's a form of love which reflects God. Justice, fortitude, temperance. Whatever virtue it is, they're simply forms of love. But in that opening quote I just used, Teresa is stating very much part of our human condition. And nowadays, uh, after looking a lot, you know, reading a lot, I spend very much of my time in reading. And, and um, very much now just honing in on Catholic authors. Uh, the Catholic author series at Mount Carmel Center, trying to reintroduce our literary heritage to people. They really gobbled it up. Uh, they'd never heard of these people before. That's why I was you know, trying to reintroduce these authors to the laity, whoever else came. But uh, looking at all, a lot of authors, they, they reach a point where they have one theme as their building block. You know, it's their perspective on how to approach any topic. And, it, and I began to find for myself, whenever I start to look at th something or think about something or approach a topic, I'm asking myself, first of all, well, what's the human condition in this? What's the, you know, I, I look at it from, if I'm a human being and, I, and I'm, I'm presented with all these different kinds of phenomena all through life, how's it affecting me? What's, what's my reaction? What's my response? So therefore I said, well, what's the human condition within this? So I start with the human condition. How do we, 
receive things? How do we approach things? What's our reaction? What's our responsibility? What happens to us? What's going on as one undergoes this uh, encounter? And how much am I to be engaged in it? I like that word engaged, because engagement means your entire being is being given over to someone else. I have engaged myself. I have released myself from other holds. Now I'm engaging completely into this matter, into this issue, into this problem at hand. The problem being whatever it is presented. So Teresa, in her detachment, opening that opening statement, she's really bringing out our human condition as it struggles with what do I have to let go of? What do I have to surrender? What do I have to know what's important and of what is of lesser importance for God? Always keep in mind God is first. And little by little, accepting one's limitations, one lit of weaknesses, one's capabilities, one within one's capacities, within one's vocation, the boundaries there. We have to learn how to cultivate, chisel, mold our attitude and our imagination and our will so that God can infuse the other virtues that help us then to be perfected. And he will do ultimately the work if we give ourselves over. And so that's the thing about detachment. It's a matter of surrendering to God. You want the over if there's a, like a you know a, what do they call that? Hierarchy. I mean, detachments again. Detachment as you might say is the act of being determined. Determination is the attitude, detachment is the action that shows it. That it is saying, I am willing to surrender myself to God. That's the motive. The, uh, the, the modus operandi, the grace behind it. I'm going, detachment means I want to surrender to God. I want to yield to God. I want to give myself over to God. I'll tell you about a person I was working with. She was, she'd gone through all these different religions and she wanted to, she was coming for spiritual direction. And uh, eventually she said, well, I want to become Catholic. I said, that's great. When? She says, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> she says, I know I'm not ready. I said, oh, okay, that's honest. That's, that's understandable. She says, I believe everything. I go, you do? You believe in uh, the Eucharist? Oh, yeah. You believe in Mary? I mean, as Immaculate Conception? Yeah, I understand the Immaculate Conception. I go, you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I believe it. I mean. <laughs> well, why aren't you willing to uh, convert? Because she had tried all these different religions. And in uh, Texas, you got this whole smorgasbords of who knows what kind of <laughs> faiths they are. <laughs> I'm just astounded where people come up with different faiths. I mean, you know, anyway, uh, she said, the only thing that's holding me back is this notion of surrendering to God. <laughs> well, now that's different. <laughs> I, said, I don't know. I don't know. It's a surrender to the Become Catholic, because uh, to me, you got to surrender to God completely. And you go, yeah. So you're not going to be losing anything. It's what it's what you're going to be gaining. She goes, oh, all right, all right. Just a little shift of perspective here. She said, well, I don't know. The surrendering thing just just doesn't go with me. And uh, it was part of her personality. You know. I go, well, let's look for another word. <laughs> I said, how about give in? <laughs> give in to God. Uh, I can understand that. Okay, I'll, 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 
maybe think about that. How about, um, I, I can't remember the other word I used. She said, yeah, that's, that's a little closer. And then I said, well, eel. She goes, oh, I like eel. I can do that. <laughs> I can yield to God. Pull over, go go by. <laughs> <laughs> Because I can do that. <laughs> and then about a year later, she converted to uh, Catholicism. Yeah. She's very happy. And, uh, but this is, you know, whatever word you may have to use you know, to be detached. Detachment is this yielding. It's, it's this surrendering to God, ultimately. And if we don't learn to do it now, it's going to be very difficult to do when we are at the moment of crossing over. So when I just knew died, had a terrible, agonizing death. I don't mean painfully, spiritually. This person was, uh, you know, a good Catholic. And I, you know, I began to think, what did this person do most of their life? You know, to prepare for this moment that, that, it be, that became so difficult and so spiritually agonizing and terrifying. Somehow she just didn't learn detachment. To let things go all through her life. But this is part of our human condition. It's a God-given thing. We just have to learn to let go. And I, I mentioned last night, the, uh, the great flood. <laughs> and losing a lot of things. And take God taking care of it found peace with that. And, uh, but it was just all these different things, but, you know, in, but, it, but within the real battle, as John the Cross would say, with the self is, how do I detach from things of myself, my false self? How do I detach from the attitudes that I have, that I feel that I have to protect? I think this is part of our growing up, because of uh, customs, uh, honoring uh, grandparents, our own personal history. It's hard to let go of things because we feel we have to honor these things that are basically human made, that are human uh, hand-me-downs. Whether, I'm not talking about so much material things, but material things we like to keep because we honor uh, those who have gone before us. But the, but, the, but the but part of our detachment is to really let go of everything, whether it's, you know, again, spiritual and material, so that I can be completely within the aura of God who allows me to be still who I am, but I'm free, free for God. So detachment is surrendering, yielding, in order to be free for God. This is why poverty of spirit, then, is really the virtue behind detachment. Poverty of spirit. One of the Beatitudes. So it's a very contemplative virtue. So it's one that we should, as Carmelites, embrace very much. But we look at our human condition. That's, you know, as I said, that's what I have, that's the point where I start, from which I start. And to know, well, what's transitory? I gotta learn that I'm transitory. You know? How much can I really be in possession of things when they could be gone in a moment? What, what does it mean to have life to the fullness? That's something that really holds on to certain people and acts as the drive, the, the, the drive shaft in their life. And so many people live their life wanting simply pleasure. That's what the commercials on TV give us. The fantasy world, the fantasy life. It wants to kill any notion in, in us that there's a real world that we have to deal with. So it's just bombarding us, anesthetizing us, 
with fantasy. And that fantasy is going to just lead us, I've got to have more. More and more and more. To have a full life. It's all part of the lie of the evil one. But we have to learn what's really important in one's life. And there's a word in Greek that's very important with detachment. And, and that's kairos. It means the right moment. To be able to sense when the right moment is to act, not to act, to give, to hold back, to let go, to retain, to say yes, to say no. The right moment. And it's very much a part of the meaning of detachment. So I have to know when the right moment is. I had certain prayers when I was discerning my own vocation. So I had certain vocation prayers. And when I learned that once I found my vocation, I didn't need these prayers anymore. So I went out to other prayers. It was the right moment. The sensitivity to say, I can detach from this. I can jettison myself from this. And it may be from people, it may be from things, it may be from attitudes, it may be from certain behaviors. Hopefully, not to have been imprisoned by something like drugs, the addicts, or pornography, or any kind of addiction. You know, there's all kinds of addiction. People can have TV addictions. People can have sugar addictions. They have to have their dessert. <laughs> I did. I don't want to pick out the fryers, but I do a charity. Because <laughs> it's a lesson to me. And, you know, they're diabetic. What do they eat most? <laughs> I go, what are you doing? Well, it's just to balance the meal out. <laughs> but there's all kinds of addictions. we got to notice this in ourselves, in our even our own behavior. Because we can be superstitious. That's an addiction. I knew a group, I knew a priest who was helping the migrant workers in one of the mid uh, the mid uh, states, Illinois or Indiana or something like that, and uh, and he would he'd minister to the migrant workers, so he'd say the rosary with them, you know, uh, every night, and he was left-handed, this priest friend, and he would kneel down, he'd take his rosary in his left hand, and the, and the mother would say, wait, 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 wait. Father, you got to have your rosary in the <laughs> This woman seriously needed detachment. <laughs> but I'm using this as an example because we do it too. It's not just material things. These are very serious things which we may overlook and take for granted, but which we are very much at uh, uh, attached to. And that very much can control our lives and our outlook on life and one's personal view of what life is. You ever ask yourself, what is really life? If you took away everything, if you tried to get into a mood or an ambiance of just, you let go of everything as if you're the only person on earth. You just find yourself here. Wow, what is this? <laughs> And you live your life. And you never have heard of anything. You never heard of gravity. You never heard of uh, pain. And you've never heard of what your grandparents taught you. <laughs> or what your parents. Or you never even heard of the gospel. Could you, in the raw, ask yourself, gee, what is this? What do I think this is? What do I think all this means? Then you really begin to see life on as who you are. I say this because I because I did it. I thought, wow. I'm 
glad that I grew up, you know, having God. Because I don't because I don't know if, if I just looked at life with all these things, you know, not being um, prejudiced by other people's uh, teachings or behaviors or what they uh, learning from them or whatever it is. But to really see life in the raw, as if it's a brand new thing. I, you know, I really began, I, I realized, gee, I'm glad I do have God. I do, I'm glad I do have the, the learning from other people about God. Because I don't know what would happen to me. But that's, a, but that's kind of a ground from which to start to cultivate detachment. Because then you're starting to put things in their true light, in their true perspective. What is this thing? Do I really want it? Do I really need it? And if we need something, then what is it? What is it providing for us? What is it doing to make us feel fulfilled? Something, if it's good, it's going to fulfill us with something, meaning it's going to teach us something about God. It's going to teach us something about the life that He has created and something about us living in this gift of creation. And I'll know then basically who I am and what I'm capable of doing. But as I use that, you know, with the prayers, so I don't need I don't need to use these prayers anymore. I could let them go. I didn't have to save them, put them in a box. Or, you know. But to be able to just to really let go, you know, I don't know if you ever noticed that whenever you get really upset and uh, something hasn't gone your way, I don't know if it's with you, but it was with me that, and there would be a part of anger in it. The best way. Or not the best. Well, in this way, yeah, you, you use best. Because you're trying to get to something tangible. The most effective way I could get over things was to just start throwing things away, tearing up things. I'd be so angry to start to tear up things. Just start to clean house. <laughs> it was wonderful. It was really, as they say, therapeutic. Purgative. You know, just letting go. But, but it had to be because I was frustrated and I was upset and angered and it just was like a force that took me over and the only way I could uh, subdue it was to just, just start throwing things out, tearing things up. And, uh, I don't know if that's happened to you, but uh, you try to control the anger <laughs> and do it anyways, you see. I had to have the anger there to really start throwing things away because I'd be so upset people and with life and it was immature immaturity but it worked <laughs> but it was I didn't know it then but it's a way of detaching what's the, what's the motive again behind the detachment what do I gotta what what has to happen to me before I start to detach from things is what I'm saying what's the catalyst that snaps you into a frame of mind and uh, an action that you just say, these things have got to go. <laughs> and then you find, you're really starting to find, gee, a breath of fresh air. Because now you can see out the windows. <laughs> Get all the stuff that's hoarded away from the windows and the doorways. And, you really start to see things for what they are and be free. This is what Teresa's talking about, you know, within the human condition. And then we open ourselves up to really being virtuous, she says. There's always groundwork to becoming holy. So it's really, it's part of a really understanding who we are in our human condition. Because then we start materially, then I start to build up to the spiritual. 
Some people can do it from the spiritual down to the material. It depends on the person. So detachment's objects, its gold, the fruits, the grace of detachment is putting right order in our life. That's the visible sign that you are detached. You're putting order, harmony, tranquility into your life. And God is a God of order. God is a God of harmony. God is a God of tranquility. And so he wants us to exercise detachment in order to put things back in their proper place. He wants to have us be put everything be put in order, not to be chaotic anymore, disordered. That's why we have ordinary time. One of the priests that I knew said, I'm so glad of ordinary time, because I like things just mundane. <laughs> <laughs> I go, Father, ordinary time just doesn't mean things are ordinary. <laughs> He did, for a strange reason, maybe it's uh, because of all the decades of doing at you know, Christmas and Easter over and over and over and over again. You get into ordinary times, you don't have to do much. <laughs> <laughs> You're just an ordinary person going through life. Well, Father, it doesn't what mean what ordinary is. I mean, in ordinary times, it's now to put in order the graces and the gifts that we have received from Christmas and from Easter. <laughs> you know, ordinary time is now to put into practice what we have reflected upon at Christmas, Advent, Christmas, Lent, Easter. We just don't go back into this kind of like uh, safe, uh, safe uh, room and just say, yeah, we just, I just cruise now. <laughs> and not get all excited again when Advent, Christmas, or Lent, uh, Easter comes. No, now's the time. Ordinary time is the time to put things in order by practicing, giving witness. So we have to know what we have detached from. That's why when we should have died from something at Lent that was really plaguing us. And I don't mean chocolate. <laughs> That's for children. You know, you don't go really back to what you gave up at Lent. Where you, well, to me, it's you can, because it's it's strengthening the will, of course. But as we get older, we really should look at ourselves more and more spiritually. Here's what do I really want to die of? What do I want to put in order so that I can really have? A full life with God's grace in the Lord, really breaking through the veil and seeing the mystery and the phenomenon of the invisible of this life that just whets my appetite for eternal life. As Teresa would say, I die because I can't die. That's the one thing she couldn't do detach yourself from this notion of life. <laughs> I die because I can't die. St. Paul said that. He probably got it from St. Paul. I want to die and go home, but here I am in this life. <laughs> For however long it is. You see, really that's kind of the goal that when one is really detached, all they want is God. They want, they want out. <laughs> Get me out of here. <laughs> Get me into you. You know, your uh, heaven, and so on. But she's saying this grace of detachment puts right order in one's life. Sometimes people say, why aren't things working out? Sometimes they say, well, is your life in order? And here's where I introduce then simplicity. Here's the other virtue. You got poverty of spirit. The other, you know, the other virtue really coming out of this is the virtue of simplicity. Living a simple life. 
not being a simpleton, <laughs> but a life of being a very simple person. I know my place in God. I know who I am in God. I know my part that I can contribute to God's glory, to the church, to my family, to society, to my Carmelite chapter. I know my part in the whole. And then one has integrity. Detachment leads to integrity, meaning I know how to integrate with all the things that are part of my life. And I stay within that integrity until God leads me to somewhere else or shows me something new about myself that I now make integral and I leave something behind I don't maybe jettison it I just part I just kind of keep it in keep it in my little blessed closet <laughs> in here <laughs> for the Lord to give back to him but now I'm on to something else to live a simple life and that's knowing what your likes and dislikes are it's knowing how you are. Again, it all comes back to self-knowledge. But detachment is to lead to simplicity, she says. Part of, as part of being in right order. I know my place in God's plan of salvation. It's not determinism. It's just, now I can really contemplate who I am in what God has given me, where I am, and really make this a bit of heaven on earth. You understand what I'm saying? This is what Teresa is talking about. Because when you really delve into her teaching in the way of perfection, she's always trying to call the sisters back to where they are. And, and, and spiritual life and religious life you know, uh, family life is, 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 you know, life in general is this. It's just calling oneself back to that integrated place where one is one with God. Detachment helps us to be at one with God. Peace of mind and heart. But I've got to have that integrity to do this. And that's why simplicity is this second product of detachment, she said. So then, she said, when all this is in place, and with detachment making us humble, then we are prepared for union with God as far as possible in this life ready for the complete union in eternal life with God. You have to learn to bring Christ into everything that you're thinking, everything that you're imagining, everything that you're doing. I'm surprised how many people dealing with, you know, working with them in spiritual direction or in confession. People just leave, they love God. No, that's not the question. That's not the problem. It's just, well, why aren't you bringing Christ into this? People say, gee, you know, why should I? It's a matter of just you know, taking care of you know, a broken washing machine. <laughs> I go, bring Christ in it. <laughs> in the washer? <laughs> I go, no. <laughs> into the problem. To keep you tranquil. To keep you say, well, what's the matter at hand here? how to deal with it. I'm surprised how many people just leave Christ out of everything. Christ is over there and people are trying to handle their problems as if they just want Christ to watch them. And then they get upset when God didn't help them. You know, I've learned everything, literally everything, we should bring Christ into it. And then we, then we start to put on Christ's perspective. We put on Christ's consciousness. 
And that really one thing will help us to maintain a certain serenity and a poise in meeting the situation at hand. And of course, knowing, do I act or not act? Do I say yes or no? Do I stand up and offer my opinion? Or do I remain silent? Like, you know, hey, this is old, oh, this is too much for me. I better hold back. Or, yeah, I can handle this situation. And, and you grasp it. These are, this is all part of, you know, the positive part of detachment. You're detached that you can become attached to God. That's what God is always trying to do to us. He's trying to whittle us down, chisel us away to be detached that we can be attached to Him in everything that we're doing, in our thoughts, how we are thinking, how we are planning. I mean, literally everything about us. Then we are true, we are, we have, we are integral with God's grace. We are integral with with him in this work of redemption. Redemption is all part of detachment. You want to be redeemed, being free from slavery to something, then practice detachment. Give up something. Part of it's no again the right moment. When do I give this thing up? Sometimes and that goes a lot with prayer. We should bring detachment into prayer. She says sometimes people, just because they get bored, I can't understand how people can get bored. I really don't. It's, it's, it's foreign to me. I can understand being bored. You get bored into something, like an insect bores itself into a tree. But for people just to say, ah, I'm, I'm just bored of life. I think I'll commit suicide. Oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, I don't say, say that. No. But that's kind of what the, you know some people have done. They're so bored of life, they commit suicide. They, they should be detached from this lack of enthusiasm. You know, they need something. But you know what I'm saying is that. <clears throat> God wants us to be detached so that we can com be completely rooted, bound in Him, attached to Him. This is what a pure heart is. A pure heart is completely bound to God because He has bound Himself. He's bound us to Himself. And that's why Detachment, the real battle comes up for detachment, comes in the heart. An obstacle is sentimentality. Some people are so sentimental, they just can't let go of things. Some people are so hard hearted, they can't let go of a grudge. This is where detachment really is a battle in these kinds of things. Not so again, not so much with material possessions, but with these in you know, these more interior uh, struggles. So it's this separation. Detachment means separation. I want to be separated from anything that keeps me from being united with God. Spiritually, it's a willingness to sacrifice. So it's an act of love. Again. Detachment is an act of love. A willingness to sacrifice, give up any worldly possession on one hand, or on one level, or give up a value for the sake of a higher, deeper, more gracious spiritual good. So they have different kinds of terms we use, renunciation, mortification, Dying to self, stripping the old self for a new self, purification of the senses. John the Cross uses that. Jacob in Genesis chapter 32, verses 33 and 9. He had to leave his possessions in order to wrestle with God. He's a, he might say he's a patron saint of detachment <laughs> for us. 
from the Old Testament, Jacob. He sent his family, he sent all his possessions over the river. And he goes across the back of the river to say, oh, come on. Who are you? And all night long, Jacob wrestled with the, with the angel of God. Jacob lost. <laughs> in fact, he got injured. His hip got thrown out of the whack. But he's, but he's a sign of detachment. If you want to know God, just as we were talking about last night, if you want to know God, you got to enter into the darkness, you got to enter into the silence. Jacob shows us that if you want to encounter God, you have to let go of everything except for the desire for God. That's when contemplation starts. I wanted to mention contemplation just a moment ago when you really are uh, you're living your simple life when you really know your place in God's universe then you're really beginning to be contemplative some people just never find their place to me it's, it's rather fascinating some, you, uh, some people just don't want to or I'm saying you know everything is you got to living your life, etc., etc. Can you make your life simpler? Then you really begin to be contemplative because you're seeing where who you are in God's eyes and, and what you are to be doing for God. Letting all these other things go. I don't worry about the liturgy anymore. I don't worry about the missions anymore. God's in control of them. You know, I've learned that my life is just focused on one thing. I've mentioned this before. It's the indwelling presence of God and purity of heart. That's what God's given me to do. And all these other things, I just kind of let go of. I pray for them, of course. And it's more and more uh, opening the door to real contemplation. Contemplation isn't such a mysterious thing. We just don't know how to put it into practice. Again, like Teresa would say, sometimes people don't, when it comes to prayer, they don't know when to detach from methods. John Cross talks about this too. People will hold on to various prayer methods. Hold on to, well, this is the way we have to pray. This is what we've got to do to win God over. <laughs> this is how i got to appease God. This is how I got to appeal to God. And we stay with it. And then some people say, why am, I, why am I not advancing in prayer? Because you're not willing to take a, the next step. To be detached and embrace what is be, what's being offered to you by God. This happens with our prayer. The more we do that, we begin to really let go of things. I mean sacramentals. I mean prayer cards. I mean certain habits about prayer. Certain worries. Anxieties about prayer. So that one can be free. Sometimes people are too afraid to break through the wall and really launch themselves into real contemplative prayer. But Teresa says some people can't do this. All right, so be it. But for most people, they just hold themselves back. But they have to know, again, the right moment, the Kairos, when to do this. That's what putting your life in right order means. It helps you to understand, to be sensitive of when to take action, when to be passive, to wait. But Jacob is an example for us. Moses is another example that I use because the great leader of the Israelite people to get to the promised land but because of the people's wickedness Moses fell into sin by pounding on the rock twice from which water came and God said you will because you sinned you were led into sin you weren't strong enough to do as I told what I told you to do. You will not enter the promised land. So you see the last scene of them there. He's seeing the promised land from a distance. 
you think, oh, gee, the poor guy, you know? He had this troublesome life all along. <laughs> the baby, he was going to be thrown into the river, but he got rescued. And then he grows up in Pharaoh's court. And he's, then he becomes an exile. And then he deals with this grumpy people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, having to intercede for them time and time uh, over and over and, and dealing with all these problems and he's a poor guy and then they get to the promised land and God says sorry Moses <laughs> you can only look at it from a distance <laughs> I'm convinced Moses said that's alright I've done my work for you, Lord. You gave me the grace, and I am proud to give it back to you. I am so happy. I am so joyful. I don't need to enter into the material promised land. I see it from afar, and that satisfies me enough. To me, he is a wonderful example of detachment. <laughs> Jacob on the spiritual level, or the material level. Moses on the spiritual level. Two wonderful examples, personages from the Old Testament, teach us detachment on two different levels. Jesus himself says, one deny, must deny oneself in order to take up one's cross and be able to follow me. So we are to be free for God alone. And this is what detachment is. Again, just as to be determined for God alone is a means of becoming free. Detachment is that freedom. Cult it helps to cultivate that freedom for God alone. From anything, material possession, from other people, from spiritual attitude, spiritual behavior, whatever that any everything is free to sense. To be free. So I can be at one with God. Perfection, chapters 8.